This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host, researcher and entrepreneur, Ali Tikkanen. Welcome, everyone. I'm very excited about the guest of today's episode. His research relates to the primary prevention of diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. He has published in overall some 500 peer-reviewed papers and chapters, including several papers in The Lancet. He is editor of book titled Sedentary Behavior and Health. He works at the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute, Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to introduce our guest, Professor Neville Owen. Welcome, Neville. Ollie, thank you for those kind words. Yeah, thank you for, for taking the time to be the guest. So, so how is everything in Melbourne? Well, it's almost the football grand final, Ollie. Australian football is reaching a crescendo, so we are all excited. All right. I, I can hear from your voice that uh, Aussie football is a big thing for you. Oh, yeah. But bicycle racing, of course, is a lot more quirky and fun. All right. Yeah. So so how, how long you have been doing research? Oh, uh, Ollie, I started my PhD half a century ago. All right. That's a long time. Yeah. So I, I wanted to start with quite general question, as as it's always thrilling to hear opinions from people who have been doing research for a long time and have a nice time sp- time perspective. So how do you see the current sedentary behavior research promotion and public awareness when you compare it to earlier ex- experiences from exercise promotion, smoking cessation, and the like? We're at a very interesting point now where uh, the physical activity and public health field has included quite a lot of, I guess, scepticism and quite critical looking at the evidence on sedentary behaviour. But really, in the last few months, we've begun to see uh, new papers coming out. The evidence just keeps coming through strongly and consistently. And I feel as if the scepticism about the relevance of research on sedentary behaviour in the physical activity and health field is starting to fade into the background. We have the US Surgeon, the US guidelines documents now. Uh, we have a range of things going on in multiple countries. So I think the field of physical activity and public health is starting to properly swallow and digest something that is new and different and some have seen it as as perhaps challenging. I don't see it that way, but some have. Hmm. Yeah. And and what is your prediction? How will sedentary behavior be in five, ten, twenty years? Will the will the promotion work for the public? Well I believe that for the public, what will work is when we have government and business and industry seeing that there are issues that need to be addressed with policy changes and environmental changes that are well thought through, that people have been consulted about, and they're they're substantial things. I always think back to workplace smoking bans and the, you know, that that obviously was a, a, a much more clear, powerful public health issue. Sitting mm. is more diverse, but there are good parallels with what we learned from tobacco. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm less thinking along the lines of persuading the public and getting people to believe it. I think there's a groundswell of interest. I think a lot of people have taken the ideas on board. 
but it's now got to go through into occupational health and safety. They've got to be, you know, a, there will need to be some awareness of the risks of prolonged unbroken sitting in multiple contexts. And that includes how we think about designing cities, especially in Australia, where people can get stuck sitting in a car for two hours at the end of each day coming to and from work. So I believe it's, it's part of the struggle we have for getting environments that allow people to be active as a normal part of their lives and anything that deprives them of those opportunities is bad public policy and needs to be looked at carefully and changed. Mm. And, and so basically, uh, urban design will be the responsibility of governments. How do you see the workplace? Is it, is it the employer or should there be wider policies uh, telling how the offices should be designed? How do you see this? Well, we have an interesting case in Point Ollie in Australia where um, our national occupational health and safety body, uh, which is a national body that makes recommendations, but regulations and laws are then at the level of individual states. Now, our national body has now got sitting at work identified as an emerging occupational health and safety issue. As more evidence comes in, it may recommend uh, you know, um, guidelines. It may then say, well, in fact, states should consider regulating prolonged sitting at work as, as a real health issue. It will be interesting. Uh, with tobacco, of course, what we had in Australia, which was a real leader in tobacco policy, we had um, cases where workers who were exposed to cigarette smoke in their environment in the hospitality industry, there was one particular claim made by the family of a woman who had died of lung cancer. And it was attributed to workplace exposure to cigarette smoke, that just was a total game changer. We could have a game changer for sitting if perhaps an older, overweight worker with diabetes was in a job in a call centre or in an environment where they had long periods of sitting that they were discouraged from taking breaks. And if that person actually died on the job, that could be a, a total game changer for sitting in the workplace. Who knows? It could happen tomorrow. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a very very interesting point, and I think it's Australia has been leading in in many of these. So it's good to hear examples from Australia. And and you have also done a study published in Lancet that looked like 14 cities worldwide and and the urban design in relation to physical activity levels. What were the main findings of this study? Well, that the, the International Physical Activity and the Environment Network study um, that, that was led by Jim Salas with Ilsa de Bordedui and me as the investigators and a wonderful network of people in multiple countries And we were able to demonstrate that objectively measured moderate vigorous physical activity using accelerometers would vary mm. systematically with walkability attributes of the neighbourhoods in which people live. So if people had uh, well-connected streets, uh, good access to uh, local food outlets and other destinations, that there was enough density of population that uh, there were services and places to go mm. available, that made a huge difference to people's overall moderate vigorous activity. And we showed that similar attributes, less strongly but still significantly, could influence their sedentary time as well, with 
we've published on that in preventive medicine. So, you know, we have, it was a, a wonderful study to be part of, and we're still working our way through the data. Um, and we hope, and we're hoping to build on that by being able to demonstrate that walkability is also related to chronic disease outcomes, especially heart disease. And we've got a study at the moment in, in Japan where we're looking at national data and it does look like walkability is related to risk of cardiovascular disease across the whole of Japan. So it's fascinating. We're beginning to join the dots with health outcomes. We, of course, now need really good data showing mediation of environmental attribute influences through physical activity and sedentary behaviour to impact then on biomarkers of health risk and health outcomes. That's on the go and we're hoping it's not too far down the track. Mm. Yeah, and, and what were the, the cities that were the best examples of walkability? Mm. Uh, well, I mean, Ghent in Belgium, those high walkable areas, of course, were, were excellent. And if you visit Ghent, it's, it's pretty obvious from the, the transport and, the, and the, the, re, you know, the residential opportunities. In general, uh, things worked so much better for walkability in those cities in Europe that have got mm. well-established attributes, good public transport. That's, that's where things work well. However, high walkable areas in Australia and the US, you know, the, the more inner city kinds of areas, there were, there were quite strong effects there as well. Hmm. Yeah, and and was there some other important features than than walkability that had the effect on on the physical activity levels? Well, um, where where we've been able to take some looks at it, and that we we really need to tease that apart more, automobile dependency to really get a sense of to what extent are people really dependent on automobiles for getting about the regular things in their lives, like getting to and from work, doing errands. You know, that, that seems to be one of those really fundamental dimensions we need to tease apart more. Time in cars is certainly related to overweight and obesity. Takemi Sugiyama has shown that it's time in cars is related to cardiometabolic risk to biomarkers, to yeah, to cholesterol and other lipids and to, uh, to, I think, to glucose measures as well. So we've got a very compelling patchwork of evidence to pull together in this field of environment, walkability and health. And really, I mean, it's, it's early days with a lot of excitement and, and a lot more evidence that is beginning to come in. And, and I feel a lot more receptivity to these ideas from epidemiology, public health, and even some of the mainstream medical journals. So great opportunities for people who want to want to pursue research careers in that field. Yeah, so there's there's great opportunities for improved city design, which will help then to go go for better physical activity levels than it's just how to how to achieve those with the politicians and and do you see some some way of going with the politics how how we can push the city design to to a better one well ollie in australia um one of the the great success stories has been how our national heart foundation which is a non-government organization has taken on the physical activity as a key agenda and uh, environment for active living as its main focus. Not mm. running campaigns motivating individuals, but 
working with local governments, lobbying state and national governments to say, we need more opportunities for people to be active as a normal part of their lives. Build that in. And there are wonderful case studies of um, smaller local government areas, you know, rural towns, uh, some of the outer areas of the bigger cities where the local governments have taken that on. And it's been a serious element of how they're investing in building communities. The credibility of physical activity for health, when you drill down, is hugely strong and there's huge enthusiasm among people in local government for more of this evidence to really strengthen the cases they want to pursue. So I, I think there are, you know, we doing research, we sometimes get a bit glum and say, oh, you know, well, it's so slow and things could change. Well, you know, it, it took a long time from the first Surgeon General's report on smoking and health, or, or in the UK, even before the US Surgeon General's report, you know, the mm -hmm. College of Physicians in England, they had their report. It took a few decades to really crack in substantial ways the, the tobacco nut in developed countries. And unfortunately, it's pushed the tobacco industry into developing countries now. So our neighbours to the north in Indonesia have got, you know, 50, 60% male smoking rates. So, you know, uh, evil never sleeps, but science is a great antidote. Let's have a short break and hear a few words from our sponsor. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian, a research device that has been shown to be valid in tracking sitting, standing, physical activity and energy expenditure. Furthermore, Fibian has been shown to be valid categorizing physical activity into light, moderate and vigorous intensity. In addition to scientific accuracy, Fibian provides automatically produced and easy to understand reports for research participants. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. So, yeah, there's, there's many things in, in city design and, and disease prevention. My next question was about your paper about behavior epidemiology and the, the systematic framework you, you made in that. Could you tell a little bit more about this, this framework? Oh, I'm, I'm very glad you asked, Oli. Um, the behavioral epidemiology framework was something that Jim Salas and I worked out we could use to organize the structure of our book that was published now back in 1999 on physical activity and behavioral medicine. And mm. we, we used that as the organizing framework for the book. And then uh, at the time, I was setting up a new human movement program at Deakin University, which was brand new. It was meant to be a public health program. They'd recruited me and, and given me the tough job of changing old physical education schools. And Jim came out on sabbatical. Jim and I worked on the framework. It was very much part of the conversation as we were building the program at Deakin University. It was a model that shaped the program. We then published a, a paper saying behavioural epidemiology is logic from understanding how behaviour is related to disease and risk of disease. One must then be able to measure the behaviour, understand its prevalence and distribution in populations, understand what are the determinants of the behaviour which you test in interventions. You then feed all of the findings across that, those logical levels of research up into policy as much as you can and you use all of those domains to inform each other. And 
that to to us just seemed like it was good sense. But we were delighted with how people were picking that up and using it as a way of thinking systematically and more broadly about physical activity and, and indeed other public health problems. So I mean, the behavioural epidemiology framework is a, is a great source of, of pride for me and Jim as something that's stood the test of time and, and, and been quite influential. Yeah, and and how how do you see this framework? Is it does it guide like individual research, or does it guideline the bigger policies in a country or the the whole research? How how do you see it being used for for an individual researcher? One might be a researcher focused primarily on measurement and measurement development. Now. Mm. If you think about measurement and measurement development, you really need to reflect back on health risks and biology to understand what might be most important to measure. Uh, You need to also think, if I'm developing measures, how might they be helpful in population surveillance? How might they provide unique insights into outcomes of interventions? And do they make sense to policymakers? Are they, you know, are they things people can relate to? So, to me, whatever the particular focus of your research is, to have breadth of perspective and think more broadly about what you are doing and how other areas will inform what you are doing and how you will inform other areas, that is. That's what makes for good research that's useful. Yeah, and and for example, in case of sedentary behavior, this uh, development of measurement, what do you see as as important factors for the for the devices or measures? Well, our big challenge is getting device derived data to be able to be seen from the point of view of the context that people are in, to understand where people are and to be able to time stamp device derived data from accelerometers, incronometers and probably very soon wrist worn devices are going to deliver pretty reliably for research grade work really being able to timestamp that linked to context. That to me is the big challenge. If we know where the activity is happening and the attributes in the environments and the social context around that activity, we get a lot of traction to find out what can make a difference. So with the Timestamp to context, you are meaning like where the person is, what is the activity, social behavior he's doing, or or do I understand correct? That is correct, yes. You know, attributes of the physical environments people are in, the social attributes of the environments they're in. So if they are in a workplace, then their behavior is constrained by the nature of their job and influenced by work colleagues and the social management structures in the workplace. Uh, Mm, One looks at the domestic environment and there are things to do with the physical design of where people live, the furniture, the particularly the screens that are around and of course the demands of relationships and family life. All of those things are physical and social environments are the things we can come to grips with, talk about, and hopefully get help people to think more usefully about those and how they can be different for better health. Hmm. 
And and then if if we talk about this whole framework and phases of research, how do you see that? Where are we now with it with sedentary behavior research and translating it into practice? We we've got a time of real opportunity and translating the research into practice is already beginning to happen with uh, the evaluations of natural experiments, real world dissemination projects like Genevieve Healy is running up at the University of Queensland, uh, at the Baker Institute, we run trials that are in workplaces and we work with people to make changes in their home environment. So we're already seeing a lot of studies taking these new understandings out into real world contexts and often widespread contexts like networks of workplaces or large organisations with thousands of employees. Now, Ollie, if you go to Silicon Valley and you look at big employers in yeah. Silicon Valley um, and the tech industry or, you know, architects, design firms, you see sit-stand desks everywhere. They are ubiquitous. And if you look at the data mm -hmm. on sales of workstations that give people the flexibility to sit, stand, move. It's massive in terms of just the natural commercial uptake of these things and the social uptake. Yeah, I, I think Silicon Valley is a great example that they actually really want to take care of the employee as there's a lot of competition of talent and they actually really try to make the workplace uh, good good for the people and for their well-being. That's an interesting one. I won't go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and if if I go a little bit uh, too wider and and how do you see the physical activity and sedentary behavior research field in general? How, how is the balance? in research are we researching the right things and if not how would you change the balance that's that's a great question ollie i'll i'll have to really dig down in my brain for that one um i i feel like now that the discourse out there is much more around physical activity and sedentary behaviour, or put more simply, it's around moving more and sitting less. And mm. my, my feeling is that the field probably has got people in it, especially in the big uh, epidemiological studies, where sometimes differences between people of different ages and between men and women you know, sometimes we lose a nuanced understanding that populations include many different people at different life stages with different challenges and of course now what we've got is in a lot of countries that demographic bulge of baby boomers born after the Second World War, where they now form a very large group of older adults, often living with chronic disease, often living with mobility disabilities, where alternatives to just sitting and sitting and sitting have got huge potential benefit. And of course, for us, we are very we are quite obsessed with diabetes, and we think the potential to get huge gains for diabetes prevention and management through focusing on the lower end of the activity spectrum, sitting time, 
breaking up sitting, lighter activity, simply less sitting and more uptime and movement will translate to better pain tolerance and to a whole range of benefits, many of which we still need to document and get out there. So there's a lot of different people in the population and we need to keep track of that and, and really have that in the front of our minds, especially as we look at and debate what epidemiologic studies are showing or not showing. Mm. So taking care more about the special populations and do you see more in the applied science, the behavior change or also with the, when we're studying the, the kind of acute effects of sedentary behavior, should we also look at the special populations oh. in these kind of basic I mean, studies? There are now we're seeing evidence coming out and ongoing studies where, for example, uh, the potential of just reducing and breaking up sedentary time in people living with rheumatoid arthritis, you know, a chronic inflammatory disease mm -hmm. where we do have evidence that long periods of sitting are pro-inflammatory so that, you know, in people living with a whole range of diseases that have got a significant inflammatory component, being able to damp down that systemic inflammatory background that really is promoted by long periods of sitting has got potential to provide a lot of benefit, possibly you know, help with reducing the amount of medication that people living with chronic diseases would need to take. So there's a lot of new breaking evidence coming out for a range of chronic diseases. We're, sed we're changing sedentary behaviour looks highly promising. Mm, yeah, that's that's interesting, the relation to inflammatory conditions. Do you see any any other specific populations that maybe haven't been studied, but could you come up with anything that could have a link uh, with the sedentary oh, behaviour? Well, uh, one that is really exciting is the mental health area. You know, it's been known for a long time that an, an attribute of people who are depressed or people who've got, you know, kind of do, dis, disorders within that psychotic spectrum, an attribute of those people is that they will just do a lot of sitting. And of course, sometimes the medications that they're on mean that they they have less energy, but they don't feel quite as bad. And the potential in the mental health area for adding to what we know about the huge benefits of physical activity and exercise training, in particularly in depression, which is a common disorder out there, there's huge potential. And there's a very exciting bit of evidence that we have begun to tease out with our colleague Matt Holgren at the Karolinska Institute. Matt has been doing, looking at large databases in Sweden and showing that mentally active sedentary time seems to be protective against the development of depression, whereas passive sedentary time, like just TV watching, increases the risk of incident depression prospectively. So uh, we have a paper that will come out early next year in Exercise and Sports Sciences Reviews where we've kind of unpacked some of the evidence and really talk about what a research agenda could be around mentally active versus passive sedentary time. And there's interesting bits of evidence dotted around from studies in Japan and elsewhere that suggest that's potentially a really fruitful area and especially so in mental health. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. So let's hear a few words from our sponsors and get back to that right after. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian, a research device that has been shown to be valid in tracking sitting, standing, 
physical activity and energy expenditure. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. So how do you define mentally active and passive? Like if you play computer games, is it active or passive? Well, I mean, I, I believe we've got a lot to figure out with really monitoring and making sense of the different, you know, the more subtle differences in energy expenditure or other metabolic processes that go with just regular old TV viewing, playing computer games, working on a computer with intense mental activity for solving problems, sorting out things in business, doing science. You know, the, the, there are some remarkable case studies out there about chess players or pl people who play hugely mentally demanding board games mm -hmm. and just the amount of energy that they will expend when they're sitting playing those board games. It's fascinating. It, yeah? it truly we, is. We don't know as much about that as would be good to know. You know does intense mental activity involve more um, you know, energy consumption by the brain? Does it stimulate more systemic, you know, kind of energy usage with intense mental activity? Fascinating. I mean, there may be there may be some really good things about what people currently do sitting that might in the future be a whole other world when people are able to stand up on moving platforms and interact with holograms. Mm -hmm. Who knows? I mean we're you know we're seeing the, the beginnings of that with the Wii devices. Technology is going to take us into some amazing places for you know mentally and physically active and inactive dealings with cyberspace that good science fiction writers are starting to imagine. Mm -hmm. It'll be fascinating. It is. And so mentally active and mentally passive, uh, do you think the mechanism is related then to the energy expenditure or blood flow in the brain? What, what is your guess? What could be the mechanism? Well, that may be one of the mechanisms, and there are always multiple mechanisms that will go on for how sedentary behaviour impacts health. So you've got, you know, muscle metabolism, you've got vascular biology, you've got a whole range of things going on. And yes, there will be that element, but also there are, you know, the kinds of social engagements and virtual social engagements, people's sense of being, you know, part of a much bigger community if, if they're involved in gaming. Yeah? They've, they've got to be elements of that that really are beneficial in all kinds of ways and maybe they counterbalance the fact that at the moment a lot of that goes on with just sitting. Mm. It's a very interesting, complex story to be teased out. And I, I wouldn't discount just the importance of the social factors if people are just watching TV buried in their own heads there's a lot of social interaction that might be being missed hmm. I agree yeah so there's there's many mechanisms and many effects of sedentary behavior and quite many researchers are studying the link with diabetes and cardiovascular disease, but not so many in relation to cancer. Could you tell us a little bit more about this as you have been studying cancer also? Hmm. Well, the in the cancer field, there is now a lot of interest in sedentary behavior. And uh, it's worth having a look at the the papers published in Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise 
on from the uh, the US Guidelines Task Force. And from memory, there is a nice paper led by Anne McTiernan that looks at physical activity and cancer. And from memory, there are elements of that that also address sedentary behaviour and cancer. So it's, it's there on the radar for cancer people and there's a whole lot of new evidence that will be coming through, I think, quite soon. Mm. But, you know, in cancer, we, we mustn't forget that the big ticket cancers, breast cancer and colorectal cancer, which are highly prevalent, they are metabolically driven cancers. They have many risk factors in common with diabetes and heart disease. They're related to overweight and obesity. They're probably related to a lot of the same things that increase risk of diabetes and heart disease. So there's, there are very strong links in there. Mm. And for the management of some of the less common but serious cancers like you know, the lymphomas and the blood cancers, the role of physical activity in really improving the outcomes of cancer treatment is getting a lot of attention now. And that includes looking at how reducing sedentary behaviour may well be important in optimising the benefits of um, radio and chemotherapy or, you know, um, or stem cell transplantation in these hematological cancers. Mm. So there's a lot going on out there. Yeah, and, and you said that improving the treatment of the outcome of the cancer treatment in in blood cancer, do you see the same in, in other cancers or is it specific to blood cancers? Yeah, well, uh, I I think that for a majority of cancers, um there are there's there's a body of evidence out there for a very high proportion of cancers where physical activity can be so beneficial in the treatment and the management of those cancers uh, as far as cancer risk goes well we certainly know inactivity and then the link through diabetes to breast and colon cancer are um, quite strong both both through diabetes and and more more broadly through uh, weight gain and inactivity they're there i guess there are other cancers where the role of physical activity it might be there but we don't understand it the rare cancers it's very ha hard to tease mm -hmm. out what the risk factors might be and you know, some of the, in in that cancer space, physical activity looms large, but cancer is so heterogeneous that you know it's it's physical activity and sedentary behaviour and changing those. Uh, we wouldn't we shouldn't be saying they're going to be panaceas, but they've got an important role to play and a very important set of roles to still be figured out scientifically mm, yeah and and moving to another theme i noticed your uh, paper from this year from july the the meta-analysis of sedentary behavior physical activity and all-cause mortality and i think here you introduce a term uncompensated sedentary behavior metabolic equivalent hours could, could you open up this variable? It sounds very, very interesting. Um, now, that which, which paper are you talking about there? Is that the Ulf Ekelund paper? It was the uh, Journal of American Medical Directory Association. Ah, Su yes. Su the, the, the paper with, uh, with, my, with my colleagues from yeah. China. Yes. yes. Yep, got it. Got it. Um, that in that paper, it's 
he is a very clever man and really figured out that if one is going to compare the effects of physical activity and the effects of sedentary behaviour and to properly do the kinds of, you know, isotemporal substitution studies we mm. do these days where, you know, you look at what is the impact of different kinds of physical activity or sedentary behaviour taking into account what else people do. What, what he's done is adjusted the physical activity variables for intensity. And that, I think, is very clever. I was wondering how it would all come out because, of course, um, you know, what it does is it says, if you're going to say um, what are the effects of 30 minutes of physical activity versus an equivalent amount of sedentary behaviour, well, it might be more appropriate to say uh, if we're looking at vigorous activity, mm. you know, we should be comparing perhaps, you know, much smaller units or adjusting the units of activity for their intensity. And um, I, I've, I've really enjoyed working on that paper, but the mechanics of how he did it quantitatively stretched my poor behavioural scientist's <laughs> <Yeah>. brain <laughs> severely. <laughs> But it's a great it's a great paper and people are getting fascinated by it. I would recommend it. Okay, let's get back to that in a moment and hear a few words from our sponsors. The Physical Activity Researcher Podcast has created an activity tracker purchase guide for researchers. Get your free copy from the link in the podcast description. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. Yeah, yeah. The, in, in conclusion, it says that our findings suggest that overall daily sitting time energy expenditure of seven met hours in excess of what expended on MVPA is independently related to all-cause mortality. So I was trying to understand, like, what does it actually mean? So it's do I understand correctly that it's the vigorous activity is normalized or or every activity is normalized to energy expenditure. So basically if you do yeah. let's say one minute of vigorous activity with ten mets, that is same as as sitting ten times less that time. In, in a way, if it's 10 that's, minutes and sitting is one. That's right. That's right. All right. That's yeah. a very, very nice take on that, Ollie. And I mean, really, the, the broad point is all activity is good. And the higher the intensity of the activity within people's capacity to tolerate that, the better it is. Mm. Yeah. That's, yeah, I think that's. That remains such an important message and to really be always mindful of the intensity of activity being such an important part of, of the benefits delivered or you know how it might balance out sedentary time. Now, I, I always think of um, you know elite athletes, who, who train for endurance sports or even, even uh, people who train for very explosive sports, the amount of time they spend resting in order to recover is huge. Mm. And we would classify a lot of them as being couch potatoes, often with, you know, the well over the the, you know, seven to nine hours of sedentary time we think is is getting into the danger zone. Yeah, but they need it. They need the recovery. Yeah, but what what do you think? Where is the 
where is the limit? I can easily see that if you do a hard, uh, high intensity interval training and you have the acute fatigue from it, it's probably best to lay down and even fall asleep. But how intensive you think the training needs to be that it compensates for the sedentary behavior? Well, for the vast majority of the population, uh, they they really so infrequently get to that level. Yeah? Mm. Uh, there might be some people who would go out on the weekend and do a very long hike and be really tired and need to, to lie down and recover. But for most people, meeting the physical activity guidelines, walking to and from work and perhaps walking the dog and, you know, doing a little bit of activity, people don't need exceptional amounts of rest. You know? Yeah. People very yeah. quickly adapt to, you know, a, an active routine of daily life that's really good for their health and it's it's more energizing than it is fatiguing. Yeah. So would you say that for normal people they shouldn't be thinking that the physical activity is compensating or giving them more right to sit more would you would you say it like this well i would i would say to normal people uh re- try, make every effort to read your body and there will be times when rest is a good thing and rest will actually then mean uh, you can become, you can be more active after your rest. Mm. And, you know, I, I, I really think that just the periodization and the rhythm of people's activity, uh, I think people can be really quite active with just a varied pattern. Yeah. And if you've had to really sit, sit at a desk late in the afternoon and work hard, uh, often that's a great stimulus to a much more brisk walk to get home or to get to the train. Yeah, you know, I think, I, I think I... too, you know, there, there's we don't want complicated and confusing messages, but you know, the just the the balance and the rhythm of that, and you know, people. Well, look, um, too much activity can make you quite tired. And just at the same time, too much sitting can make you quite tired. We have a nice study that Paddy Dempsey did where he looked at people's subjective ratings of fatigue in one of our laboratory studies across a day when they sat uninterrupted all day compared to days when they broke up their sitting for three minutes every 30 minutes. And across the sitting day, they got more, they rated themselves as more and more fatigued as the day went on. The breaking up days, they actually rated themselves as feeling better and more energetic across the day. Yeah, I, I, I can see that also from my personal experience. Sometimes when I'm, I'm forced to sit, I feel really, really tired oh. and I'm thinking like skipping my training. And then from experience, I know that this is just different kind of fatigue and I go training and I feel much more energetic. It's just, I think there's a different kind of fatigue that comes from, from the sedentary behavior. Yeah. And Ollie, for, uh, for us, for we, we researchers who've got jobs where we've got a lot of discretionary control over how much we sit, how much we move, how much we stand, we might get trapped by editing and realize we've been sitting for two hours because we're so captivated by a a very engaging job. But there are so many people out there and increasing numbers of them in call centers, in service industries where they're on the end of a telephone or on a computer and their jobs are just sitting and they have very, very little control over whether they whether they sit or not. Mm, yeah, I I agree. So I will I will now 
put a little yeah. bit more challenging question if if the others have been easy so so research is always based on paradigms is there anything in the field any anomalies in the results or anything that gives you a feeling or a hunch that maybe we could be on the wrong track with our paradigm or one of our paradigms hmm. i we, there are there are a lot of paradigms out there i mean we you know if you if you look at for example uh behavioral scientists many behavioral scientists have a view that a lot of where motivation comes from where habits comes from is is from within the individual so constructs like self-efficacy are talked about you know there are ideas about self-determination and motivation well i i always feel that those ideas have their place but if they become dominant ideas and those ideas then become part of how decision makers and politicians and bureaucrats how how those people think about what's important we could end up back where we were in the 1970s and 1980s where the discourse about physical activity was all about motivating people to exercise mm. that was the discourse now yes it has its place but you know an enlightened public health perspective has us thinking well actually it's a people uh people vary hugely and the worst health problems are with the most socially and environmentally disadvantaged people and we don't want you know ideas out there that say oh well it's all your own fault you know anyone can put on a pair of joggers and if you're not doing it well you're to blame for your health problems hmm. that is lurking and it's lurking in a lot of the weirdness that you're seeing in the world with you know uh, strong men political leaders and you know or the the world is in danger of going nuts and we researchers don't want to be aiding and abetting that yeah the the other thing i think we need to be aware of of course is that um it's very easy in public health to be co-opted and to have one's work used in ways that are against the public health so for example uh you know the sugary drinks companies mm. love physical activity and exercise and sport and uh you know well you know if you're going to be active you need energy and we've got sugary drinks everywhere being consumed by people who basically sit all day mm. and the health risks of sugary drink consumption for highly inactive people are just huge yeah yeah but of course the sugary drinks companies the the big the big corporate multinationals love physical activity and they even sponsor physical activity organizations yeah i i agree i i noticed that for example in uk some people might drink during their lunch a sport drink which is just sugar and i think that's like yeah it's been very oh, yeah. well marketed yeah. if you if you go and buy a, a sports drink for your lunch when you are sitting down yep oh yeah you know it's it's ubiquitous and it's it's, it's huge and we you know uh, a lot of people are getting a huge amount of unnecessary additional energy in their dietary intake through those sports drinks and of course other all the other things you can choose from the machines that dispense them yeah i i agree and if if i continue with the challenging questions uh so basically 
it was just 20 years ago when when researchers started to look sedentary behavior as independent health risk and and now on retrospect it seems stupid that why didn't we figure it out before is there anything specific specific you could come up that we are not looking at the moment but we probably should mm. Oh, Ollie, that's that's a good one. That's a good, challenging one. Um, yeah, I basically go with the know, challenging ones uh, because you have such a long experience. Yeah. Maybe we find a new yeah, bit yeah. of research from these discussions. Yeah. Now, Ollie, I, I had a thought that for I for in if I reflect on my career, I think some of the great good fortune that I have had has been in finding people from other disciplines with whom I could collaborate. Mm. And there are the usual suspects and people with whom we would want to cultivate relationships and that's, you know, those very productive collaborations between exercise scientists and behavioural scientists Uh, then there are, you know, the medical specialties where you have endocrinologists and a range of people who, you know, really do understand uh, bodily systems through the clinical manifestations of problems. Mm. So for me, the really exciting things have been in making those interdisciplinary connections and thinking outside of my habits and comfort zones and trying to relax about working with people who know things I know nothing about but who can benefit from me bringing my particular understanding to their work and I can benefit from them bringing their particular understanding to my work. Hmm. And that's not easy. You know, it's It's finding the people with whom there is good chemistry. It's uh, being willing to, you know, live with a few disappointments or feeling let down. But, you know, making that a priority, good things can really happen. Mm. Now, I would add to that, these days, with people now working in big data, people working in material science, where not too far down the track there will be you know little stick on patches or implantable things that will deliver the data that we currently struggle to take off clunky devices that we strap on people or stick on people the potential now for working with people in material science people who work in big data with technology moving forward so rapidly is just huge. You know, it's it's a whole world of wearable devices, uh, intelligent devices people can carry around with them that will help to capture huge amounts of data, Bluetooth capacities, uh, devices that can be powered by, you know, by sweat or biological energy or movement. So to, to me, there's a lot of excitement for new researchers coming through in those technology connections. Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's a great point. How, how would you see that? How can we facilitate the interdisciplinary science? Because, you know, people go to conferences. It's usually just people from the same field. The building sign away that one department is in one building and you don't really meet even occasionally the other ones. How how could it be facilitated? Oh, I I think that we 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 physical activity researchers uh, we can be proactive. You know, I mean there are there are people out there who would be delighted to be part of a symposium at one of our conferences that was uh, included 
cutting edges of technology or new insights that can be brought. And often if we look beyond you know, our, our normal groups of collaborators we work with and just begin to develop those relationships, try them out, invite people. So, for example, uh, Takemi Sugiyama, who I work with a lot, has been really good about finding people in urban planning and transport and inviting them to be part of proposals for symposia at conferences. And the receptions are very positive. Mm. You know, people go, oh, that'll be fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So I think we, we sometimes think it's a lot harder than what it is if we just give it a go. Yeah, that's a good point. So your tip is to collaborate with the people from different disciplines. And what would be your your tips for researchers applying for a big grant? I, you have had a good success for for decades with the grants. What are your your tips? Ollie, these days the first thing you have to do is just cross your fingers and hope. <laughs> probably, probably a lot of um, people are doing it, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, it it seems to me that increasingly our grants are being reviewed by people who don't have a lot of specialist knowledge hmm. of what we are doing, and it's so important for those first few paragraphs and the bits we sometimes write uh, after the fact or right at the end of things. Oh, I've got to write a 2,000 character summary. Oh, I'll quickly do that. Mm. That probably should be the first thing we write. And as we are writing our grants, that should be revised many, many times. Yeah? To have a concise description of what we do and a good title that people relate to that's the right mix of more generic and broad with enough indication of the specifics. There are, there are things in what we have to do writing our grants that I think sometimes we neglect to our detriment. Mm. And that's especially good titles, good summaries, or the layman's description. Mm. You know? Write a hundred words about your grant for people who know nothing about it or for the general public. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I think there's often like grant, with grants and articles, there's kind of a fatigue that you have done it for so long. You have read the same text that then kind of the extra things a layman description or abstract you just kind of want to get it out from your hands and and you don't maybe pay attention to the most important parts of the application actually yeah ollie for also now with good word processing software and you know what we can do just to move and manipulate text and find text and edit text. Um, I think sometimes people can get impatient, mm. want to get something done, get it off to a journal. And I've been on the other end of it many times now where papers were, you will accept a review job from a journal. You then get the paper and you start reading and you think, these people have not edited it this properly. Mm. You know, these people these are people whose primary language is English, but they have just been sloppy. Mm. They haven't proofread well. They haven't edited it to make it easy to read and accessible. There's a bit here that's just the same thing that was written in another section pasted in. Mm. There's I think a bit there's more impatience and bad practice and sloppiness out there than there should be. And for manuscript reviewers or grant reviewers, that that can be really to your detriment. Mm. 
and putting a putting a paper or a grant through three or four rounds of careful proofreading, you know, getting somebody who is not in your field but is a good writer to read it and help edit it, uh, put it away for two days, come back and read it again yourself. Uh, maybe a printout with a pencil where you scribble on it before you then do the electronic editing. I mean, we, in our laboratory, uh, David Dunstan and I have people come and sometimes we drive them nuts because we say, no, a paper doesn't go out from our program unless it's been through 10 or 12 drafts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, it's and, and and that in that also is about respect for the people who are out there on the other side of the peer review process who do things voluntarily, who you know are there doing their best to help you in a constructive and critical way. And I don't think it's showing respect if you present things that have not been done so that they are easy to read, a pleasure to read, and make the job of that person as easy as possible. Hmm. Yeah, very, very important points. So those those were for for making a grant application or publishing. What what would be your your tips for young researchers, how to build their career as a researcher? what not to do, what to do. Okay. Um, I I guess I have a particular view about that. And the first principle that I have is don't spread yourself too thinly. Don't try to cover too many different areas and do too much. Mm. Don't think that if you're very smart, you can pick up anything and do it well, and that a very diverse CV is impressive. It's much better to be really well informed about an area that you choose and to be as knowledgeable about that as you can in as much depth as you can so that your work is really good quality, is recognised as such, has a big impact and is cited, and that you are building a coherent body of work that is cumulative and you can, if you look back after five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, you can see how it is developed and is built on itself as cumulative good quality science. If you look at people's CVs and if you look at people who've had careers, if you look at people's Google Scholar profiles, the highly cited people are the ones who've really concentrated their efforts. The people with the, with, who are less well cited are the ones who've jumped all over the place and done too many different things mm. and and perhaps because they're overconfident that their abilities can be applied to anything mm. yeah that's that's a good point and how, how do you see this should this change at some point of the career it's kind of analysis ah, synthesis yes. uh, where, where should be chains or, or should it mm. There's an early career, especially after you have finished your PhD, that's a good time to be exploring. You know, ideally, you might get, you know, two years in one laboratory or two or three years in another laboratory and work with some different people. And, you know, your, your first three to five years after finishing your PhD should be a little bit of figuring out what do you 
really want to spend your time on and focus on. You know, you it 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 takes a particular temperament to have worked on something for a PhD and then just continue that same theme and keep drilling down in that. You know, I think you in careers it's really good for people to have a phase early on where there is a bit of openness, a bit of experimentation and you know, really finding what it is that you you like that will be exciting that you can concentrate much more on for big chunks of your career. Mm. And and how how long after PhD you look different options and then you choose do you do you see that you should go with that or should it widen at some point? I think you have to use your nose and use your eyes and ears and you know really be be open to where different opportunities might be and uh, in a way let the world talk to you a bit rather than being too doggedly determined about you know you must figure it out so I guess it's kind of within the pressures of the early part of careers which of course are huge these days within those pressures uh, being you know to the extent that you can relaxing into enjoying what you're doing meeting new and interesting and exciting people keeping your eyes and ears open and things will talk to you and they will sing to you and attract you and it it will happen all right yeah so so do you see that you should specialize and focus really clearly and then the widening should come from the collaboration from the with interdisciplinary work or how do you see it in a in a bigger picture it's very good to have a strong base or bases that give you things that you can offer to other people with whom you collaborate. Mm. So if you are very good at, you know, using devices to measure physical activity and using quantitative methods to make sense of those data, that is a huge attraction to potential collaborators. Or, you know, if you've got a, a good understanding of a particular biological mechanism and you're really thinking about that and you can bring a good breadth of knowledge about that to collaboration mm. that's always yeah good. so so if leonardo da vinci would be applying for a job from you would you hire him as he wasn't really concentrating <laughs> oh, <laughs> um i guess if he was if he was 23 years old and had a huge ego, I'd be wary. But if he was modest and demonstrated skills, I'd be very interested. Yeah, all right, that, that's. Good. I I think Leonardo da Vinci was a was an interesting character. I have I've been delighted with. People who have worked with our program, where there are people who have got huge intelligence and huge talent, and some of them have just been wonderful. Others have been a bit too impressed with their own talent, mm. and I think you know great talent and ability and intellectual power with you know, with a bit of modesty and respect for other people can take you a very long way. Mm. Uh, e ego uh, can really be something, you know, people are always tripping up over their own egos and falling on their faces. Mm. So no, we, you know, I've, I've had very bright people who I've admired usually and I mean, they're the people you really want to attract. It's, it's wonderful when they turn up on your doorstep. And it's, there's been a few of them over the years that I've been 
it's just been such a privilege for me. Yeah, yeah. And and before we finish, do you have any any PhD, postdoc, or other research opportunities available? You would like to advertise them a bit here. Uh, we are. It's it's actually a tight time for money for us at the moment, and it and in general in Australia, the research grant system is it's really tough. Um, we for for PH, we've probably got space for maybe one or two more PhDs. We don't have, and if people want to work with us to develop proposals for um, research funding for fellowships through different fellowship schemes. We really do, if we've got to meet people and know them, and we know they're good people we want to support, uh, we've, we've had a lot of success helping people write proposals for different funding schemes. But that's usually where there's a strong recommendation from a colleague or they're people who we've met at conferences and got to know. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of time and effort for helping people to get PhD scholarship support, helping them to get their postdoctoral fellowships or travelling fellowships. So, you know, it's where, I guess, for that, we are very wary of people who might pop up, but where they are recommended by good colleagues or where relationships have developed, we're always keen to do that. But sadly, Ollie, I'm no longer, or at the moment, I'm not in a position to play Santa Claus. I love to play Santa Claus, but and I've had times when I've had great opportunities to do that, but not at the moment, sadly. Yeah, yeah that's understandable. All right, and and the last. I think you know what I'm talking I, about. I do. And and the last last questions. Could you share some funny incidents from the years what have happened during the during the research or or in conferences? Oh yes, there was the there was the time that uh, I was I was giving a talk, and as I do, I was kind of walking around a bit, and uh, I was on a podium, and uh, I fell off the back of the podium. <laughs> I disappeared for uh, a few minutes. Fortunately, I was able to uh, I was able to get up without anything broken and All carry right. on. Did people actually see you falling? I think I think they wondered right. what happened. <laughs> a lot of them had probably fallen asleep, and uh, it helped to wake them yeah. up. There's, there is there is always that danger at conferences if you're a mobile person. That sometimes the podiums are smaller and they've got uh, dangerous places. So it's it's good fun to walk around when you talk, but be careful. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. In Finland, we had actually there was a weightlifter. I think he was in the world championships. He he did his snatch successfully, and he was walking from the stage towards the stairs, and he passed out and fell like down down from the stage, and. He, he, he didn't he didn't win but he became a legend like <laughs> yeah. I think he, he was able to push himself so hard that he actually passed out quite often after after a, a yeah. successful lift yeah. you know uh, Ollie, on that one of course Australia has the very famous Stephen Bradbury who was a terrible speed skater from Brisbane which is Hardly got anywhere where you can do speed skating, yeah. but he qualified, went to the Olympics, and he was coming last, and everybody else <laughs> fell off, and he he scooted through for a gold medal. So in Australia, we have the term to do a Bradbury. All right, yeah, that's that's it, one. Yeah. It it has been it has been a pleasure. We have covered many 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 teams, and and I I put you a little bit of difficult questions, and it was interesting to hear like from your uh, long long experience. So uh, thank you a lot for for joining this yeah. podcast. Oh, Ollie, look, thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, 
thank, thanks for more, making it very enjoyable and interesting on my side. I, I enjoyed it greatly. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. The Physical Activity Researcher podcast has created an activity tracker purchase guide for researchers. Get your free copy from the link in the podcast description. Thank you for listening to the Physical Activity Researcher podcast.